name is Theo. She was or I guess some preferred pronouns. Um, hello. Try my speech in three, two, one. Make no mistake, coming out is difficult. There will be people that will ostracize you, unfriend you. In the worst case, you will lose everything you have ever known. The problem with opening government is that they do not provide solvency. The core issue of why people have a hard time coming out is often, as they identify, people don't know where to go in the event they get kicked out. Sometimes people feel a lot of internalized shame because they come from families and communities that tell them it's cringe to be gay. We would suggest that the Out and Proud movement doesn't only just suggest that you should come out, but actively works towards a pathway in which people from different backgrounds, regardless of the degree to which the community is liberal or conservative, to allow them to come out. On their end, there's still shame. They do not provide a path to normalcy. The first thing I want to do in a somewhat of a form of response but also set up is what is prominence? Because we would suggest it's first of all obviously media, but it's also things like a trajectory towards people coming out. We would suggest it's also the interest to provide more micro and macro scale provisions to educate people on the ability to come out. So it's like pamphlets, queer spaces, teaching young individuals on how to come out, or for example, teaching allies on how to respond to an individual coming out. While these things look like social media pamphlets, and that sounds kind of funny, it's something that's still impactful because it teaches people how to become better allies and members of the queer community. But fourth, it's also the inclusion of provisions of alternatives. So in the event that queer people come out and they get thrown out, they lose a job, etc., it's also queer people in the LGBT community working together and coalescing in order to provide alternative shelters, to provide the modes of work, to provide them alternatives. And this is only possible when there is a prominence, when it is agreed and when it is institutionalized within the advocacy and within the movement, they do not give a comparison for that. The second reason is to prove why, because I do agree we do not have fiat to model this all up. The first reason is because they have the incentive to do so. Obviously, they want their own members to be safe. They want their own members to still exist. They need their members in order to pass policies, get you know, political will, do all that stuff they do in Pride March. And insofar as these people are not well fed and provide alternatives on how to come out, participate, or for example, have shelter, obviously that compromises those interests. Second, they have capacity. So often, people within the LGBT movement are the individuals who are the best arbiters to tell people how to come out, when to come out, or the fact that you should come out, because often they speak with tact, they have the best interest at heart. The third, if this is about media, as opening government sets up, we agree with that, but obviously it's about competition. The existence of prominence increases the demand for a lot of these, you know, out and proud movies to occur, so Love, Simon, etc. And often what happens is that these media houses compete in order to provide different narratives of the coming out experience, or for example, do it in a way that is a little less um, reductive, a little less, for example, stigmatized, and that's how we resolve the issue of people, you know, having very weird or myopic or toxic forms of coming out on opening government, which by the way will exist either way. The first thing I want to argue, and by the way, responses will be integrated, is this is a necessary counter narrative for what already historically exists. So often, societies are historically skewed towards telling people to be silent, for if you are gay, you should feel embarrassed and ashamed of yourself. And often, this results in a couple of things. It results to you internalizing, internalizing your oppression, gaslighting yourself into thinking that you are not of the identity that you initially thought you were. Often, you cannot fully express yourself. So if you're a trans individual, and for example, you want to express yourself in the clothes that you wear, the makeup that you wear, you're unable to do so because you're so fixated on being straight passing. Often, how do we rectify this using out and proud specifically through its prominence? First, it increases the rate by which we have inspirations to come out. It's not just the fact that people come out, but there's a diversity in people coming out. So over time, even if at the start it's still white people or rich people, for example, that we agree may not always be relatable to the people in the most conservative of spaces, as there are more people that come out, this also includes people of color, people in developing nations, people who come from religious societies, and that's what allows more people to have access to different types of inspirations and coming out stories. Second of all, it's normalization. So it's not just about normalizing coming out, it's normalizing integrating into the fact you came out. So it looks like expressing yourself, wearing different types of clothing, having PDA with your queer partner, for example. These are basic forms of things that you just see online, but also motivate and give you the idea of whether or not you should be more attuned to the person that you are. They suggest that, well, they always feel pressure to come out. We suggest it's better in a world where people want to feel like they need to come out and show themselves, for example, because that's where they're most authentic, as opposed to when they're straight passing and they they say that they like women or men or whatever is heterosexual for them. 
Third, at the very least, people feel affirmed with the cells. This is crucial because the most vulnerable people in open government will still feel destroyed, shamed, and internally alienated. But it's precisely out and proud that creates the setup to liberate them from that shame. Before I proceed closing. Within that education you say you have, how do you tell people to overcome all of those barriers? You can't just say, say it's going to be all good. So the first thing I want to say is that precisely through these narratives, obviously in order for a narrative by a media or a narrative through its pamphlets to be interesting and something that is credible, it has to recognize that there are risks, it has to recognize that there are harmful things that can happen. So as a result, for example, it makes the story interesting and it also makes the education that we give to these queer people you know, more enriching. The second argument I want to put forward is that provenance improves the out and proud narrative. So we agree that there are some people that will abuse this narrative in a way that forces people and makes them get anxiety and feel the need to come out. The first thing I will say is that Uji will say this is an imposition onto people, but we do want people to come out. There are five reasons. First, shame is often a result of internalized oppression. Two, the shame often affects others because in the interest of wanting to be straight passing, you don't want other people to think you're queer. You may be passive at best when someone gets oppressed in front of you, or actively harmful at worst when someone is oppressed in front of you. Third, often being out is necessary to leverage yourself in casual conversation. Often when you identify yourself as a member of the LGBTQ community, you become more credible when you convince other individuals to not be, you know, um, you do not give people dysphoria or to not be homophobic. Fourth, often being closeted makes you unhappy. The second thing we want to do is, how do we defeat the toxic forms of out and proud? First, prominence often makes it more visible within the movement and therefore people discuss it more, not just the general concept of coming out, but how people tend to um, message the idea that you should come out. Second of all, it often allows media to provide traction <laughs> such that we gain issue, we gain traction for the issues of the out and proud movement such as lack of access to alternatives, lack of access, for example, to information on how to come out, but also this reaches potential allies who see this media and can be informed and apply this to their personal lives when they encourage queer people in their lives to come out to their families or to their community. For in the for in the worst case, some queer people will self-regulate, often because it's in the interest that it's strategic for the movement. They want people to opt out of the movement. They don't want people to feel alienated. So obviously the way by which they will tell people, you know, at some point you should come out, is often one that is with tact, often one that is in the interest of making sure that the person has enough confidence to come out and say, hello, I'm a queer. But lastly, on content creation, often popular media competes to show our out and proud in diverse, you know, and the demand increases as I've argued at the start. This means that the discussion to improve becomes more apparent and likely, and two, we allow allies and gender people to be informed of coming out, answering all the issues for opening government. Okay. Oh, oh. individuals in a very precarious position. Either they come out which is incredibly emotionally exhausting and possibly incredibly dangerous, or they stay in the closet and are rejected and scorned at by their own community. The first thing I want to ask is who are the people that are likely to remain in the closet? This debate is not about the people in developed countries with rich and vibrant LGBTQ communities that will come out anyway because the majority of people in those communities are LGBTQ friendly and allies. This debate is about the people currently in the closet considering whether or not they should come out. The first thing I want to talk about are the kind of people that live in conservative regions or people with conservative families. They fear for their own safety, for example, if they'll be kicked out of the house. They have anxiety because they don't know how their parents will react or how their community will react. But most importantly, when you come out, you have very little control over that information. You do not know who and when they will know of your sexuality. Maybe your future employer might get a hold of this information and discriminate you on that basis. Telling them that the end goal of the LGBTQ experience is that you need to be come out makes them feel as if they're missing out something very central to the LGBTQ experience. It makes them long for this thing that was never really that important in the first place for all of these people that will never be accepted in their communities that were born within, unfortunately. But the second thing, and they do not analyze this as well, is people that currently have conflict with their own sexuality, where they're still exploring and trying to understand their own sexuality and their own purposes. For many of these people, they don't feel like they are actually someone that belongs into the 
LGBTQ community because that LGBTQ community puts a premium on coming out and says that the people that belong to our community are the people that are currently out and proud and therefore they feel excluded. The impact of this argument is huge in this debate because the people that I've just described are the most vulnerable members of the community that need their community support and validation instead of always making them dream and aspire to coming out in, a, in some imaginary community where suddenly all of them will accept them when many of them are born in traditional and conservative regions. These LGBT, LGBTQ individuals I'm talking about are the gay people that are in the Bible Belt or this looks like trans individuals or non-binary individuals where there isn't a widespread acceptance of them yet. When all of the community tells them, you'll be so happy if you come out and you'll be so accepted. This does not resonate with the trans individuals that know that people will still look at them with scorn and this does not resonate with their reality. What does the movement currently do? We hear a counter characterization coming from the previous speaker about how this will be done in a very calculated and meticulous way where you can talk to experts and then you'll be able to adjudicate when's the right time for you to come out. This movement is decentralized in nature. It's a narrative that exists in the ether. You are not talking to specific LGBTQ experts that can look at your lived experience and tell you when's the best time to come out. No, the way that individuals interact with this narrative is they see the movies, they see the posts on Reddit, they see their other friends in other Western countries coming out. And in the way they internalize that is, I am missing something out. There are three mechanisms I want to bring to you. The first is that it creates pressure through norm creation. When you have many other people coming out, it feels as if the norm for an LGBTQ person is to eventually come out, which puts subtle pressure on the individuals. Opening up, or opening opposition themselves concede this because their mechanism is more people coming out makes it easier for them to come out. Another way to say that is more people coming out puts pressure on you to eventually come out at some point. The second mechanism is the thing that Rina told you about idealization, where it's where you are told that the most ultimate happiness that you will feel and the meaning that you will get in your life comes from coming out. When you romanticize it with all the movies that show how happy these LGBTQ individuals were from eventually coming out. This means that individuals themselves psychologically put a premium on coming out where they are told that this will be the thing that resolves all their misery in their lives. But the third mechanism is that it gives them a false sense of security. When you see movies like Love, Simon and how he came out and everyone will magically accept him. This means that in your brain, you are less able to adjudicate the risk of coming out because you are filled with this grand narratives and romanticization from the movies. You're not talking to LGBTQ experts, you're watching movies and looking at Reddit posts. This means two outcomes. The first is that this puts dominance and centrality for coming out in the movement, which means that people who don't come out psychologically feel locked up of the movement, even if they are nice and inclusive and say that, you know, even if you are a positive, you're still part of the LGBTQ community, psychologically they feel like there's something different from them because they're not doing this thing that all other LGBTQ individuals are doing. But secondly, this just hurts their ability to make rational decisions. When you are pressured by norms, when you are pressured by romanticization, when you have a false sense of security, all of these things makes it harder for you to actually adjudicate the risk and you're going to have more optimism thinking that my parents will react nicely and then you eventually get kicked out of the house and then you get abandoned. Before I move on, I'll take closing. The problem here is that you yourselves give the reasons for why the pressure continues to exist even without the movies. People still watch Life Simon, people still write stories about gay people who come out and romance Simon. But the out and pop movement produces those movies. If we did not have the out and pop movement, these movies would not be as prominent and then the pressure wouldn't exist. Opening opposition in the best case of their the best case of the out and pop movement was to say that the out and pop movement gives them a roadmap to coming out. I want to note that this is horrifically uncomparative. We can do things like build shelters, we can do things like mutual aid, we can raise awareness about homophobia, we can do all of these things without the narrative that individuals ought to come out. The crucial comparison here is that their method of achieving change is through individualizing the responsibility of LGBTQ individuals. That the way you ought to be accepted, the way you ought to fight homophobia is to expose yourself in front of these conservative countries. We don't think that's the way you can get change. We can push for anti-discrimination le uh, like legislature without asking people to come out. We can fight on it on the basis of just saying that these people are human too and ought to be respected. But even if this was the way that it got changed, notice that it comes at the expense of the anxiety and paranoia of many LGBTQ individuals where they live in fear that their parents will not love them anymore because the only way for them to achieve change was because this community told them that they ought to come out. What is the counterfactual? It is deeply regrettable that many LGBTQ youth think that the only way for them to feel pride in their sexuality is for them to let the world know. We reject this premise. There is more to sexuality than just getting acceptance from an indifferent and uncaring heteronormative society. This deals with the opposition's best case. Because even if this art and pop movement was calculated and meticulous, even if this art and pop movement didn't pressure people, even if there was a good coverage of stories that talked about the lived experience of coming out, all of this funnels down to the same angle of telling them 
that they ought to be out in public. That being out in public is important. Why is it important that I'm out to my teachers or my professors or my employers? These homophobic bigots that don't care about me anyways. Why is it that I have to find pride in my sexuality only from the acceptance of these indifferent conservative individuals? We tell you that the counterfactual is quite simple. We will get validation internally. We will get the ability to feel pride in your sexuality even in the closet, even without the gazes of these other people. Opening opposition wants people to not be embarrassed of their sexuality. But look, if you come out in a conservative country and you hold your boyfriend's pet, pet hand in public and people spit at you and laugh at you, I will find it hard for you to feel dignified. You'll find it hard for you to find pride in your sexuality. For those living in conservative places, pride is never coming from external validation. We must tell them it's okay to be gay even if no one knows. But that conversation never happens on their side. The conversation that you can be a gay individual that's proud of your own sexuality in the closet never happens because of the dominance of coming out of the closet and the centrality it plays in the LGBTQ experience. <laughs> speech in three, two, sorry, sorry, so, so service level, yeah. I just want to wait. justified. By the end of this speech, I'll go increasingly more generous to the open government case so that they have no chance to advance over us in this motion. First thing on mitigation. They have told you three things that are keenly unresponded. First thing that this is a counterbalancing narrative in and of itself. All of the reasons that K-Van keeps repeating about why it is scary to come out, regardless of these tangible considerations, is proof that on average, the median person is probably still going to be irrationally too scared to come out, when in reality they probably can. Look at all of the benefits that the LGBT movement has gotten over the years, the increasing amount of things like gay pride, certain, okay, the whole LGBT movement is not centralized, but there are definitely pockets within certain regions that can culturally convey why it is acceptable in that culture. Look at New York pride, look at Philippine pride, things that can give you more concentrated, deliberate resources to help these people come out more. In the worst case, again, if it is really so decentralized and you're worried about how this rogue media will influence certain people in very conservative contexts, just like how you say it's not about the super privileged, it's not about the super disprivileged, and most likely this media probably will not reach them at the end of the day if their government cracks down on them so much. Going back to the people in the medium cases, it's that fear and anxiety that may or may not be um, rational, which is going to control these people's lives and uh, like keep withhold them from what they really want to be at the end of the day. When in reality, their parents are getting educated through more media, the social structures around them are having more media, legislation is becoming more uh, palatable to them. All that they need to do is take that first step. We celebrate helping them do that. Second level to this, right? Even if you don't believe that, why more resources are, be are better, right? We told you why, it, since you have things like New York Pride, it'll probably be deliberate media and deliberate counseling that actually give you tangible resources. But even in the worst case, where it's just media, if it's just Love, Simon, why is that a good thing? 
first level, and how it influences people themselves, right? This media obviously shows you the dangers and the pitfalls of coming out at the end of the day. It's not like you simply romanticize those things. Look at Love, Simon itself. You see the struggle there. And therefore, what you're doing is really educating people about what the process looks like and so that they can decide in their decision-making calculus. These are not children, right? They can decide if it's a benefit to them, it's worth it for them to come out right now. There is no pressure in the long term because people recognize how hard it is to do. But secondly, how it influences out groups. This is the only way that we can actually get more acceptance. The very thing that you're afraid of, that you will get kicked out. This is where you actually create humanistic sympathy for these people. Because when they watch things like Love, Simon, they realize that these are very human characters, right? You see a lot of the suffering and the crying that happens behind closed doors. And even if you don't fully understand the LGBT experience, you understand that they do not deserve to have these kinds of heartache. They should at least be able to be out to people. But lastly, just to quickly hijack the POI from CG, in terms of how it's more reductive, again, realize that media, if this is a debate about media, will often and still be created about the gay tropes or the LGBT experience, except from kinds of outgroups, or there will be less sheer amount of media, right? If it's created by outgroups, the only representation of gay people in media will be created by straight people. These are usually gag characters, parlor gays, in which they are often the butt of the joke and not really seen as uh, real people at the end of the day. This is so much worse in a multitude of ways. Being more generous now, firstly, is this really exclusionary? Secondly, if it is pressuring, why is that justified, right? Is it exclusively pressuring, right? Firstly, we tell you at the very least, there's no pressure on the time frame, right? We told you that, again, because you understand how hard the experience is, there is no limited amount of demand, the, the, uh, defined amount of time, right? It's up to you how you want to interpret this kind of media. At least you know the benefits at the end of the day. It's not like you have to do it immediately. Probably you will be given as much time as you need. No one's going to ostracize you for it. But secondly, right, we tell you that pride about something, celebrating something, is not necessarily pressure on others, right? You all often have gay icons and heroes, right, that you can glorify like MLK or I don't know, gay icon like Vice Ganda in the Philippines. You don't necessarily have to emulate them, but at the very least, you can be inspired by them and try to uh, achieve their level of thing at the end of the day, right? At the very least, even if you cannot go into this, this is the worst case, right, in which you would never really access the benefit of coming out, right? We tell you that at least you can still project yourself onto others. If this is media, it's usually a form of escape escapism, which allows people to live their best lives through this media, even if they can only dream about it in their tangible considerations. Having more media, especially because it doesn't pressure anyone, can mean whatever it wants to other people. We tell them in most of these cases, it will be beneficial. But moving on, even in the worst case, why do we think it's justified to be pressured? They say that it's right to um, decide at the end of the day that uh, whether or not you want to come out or not. We tell you that we never want to force another LGBT person to make that tough choice because the reality is you cannot ignore how dehumanizing it is to not be able to be yourself amongst others, right? Not being able to be accepted in the bathroom that you think you are, like associate with. And by the way, the LGBT, I mean the transgender experience is included within the struggle here, right? More on that later. But more importantly, right? You, you don't know how dehumanizing it is when in law they will not recognize your partner as directly your partner unless you come out and register them as the person you want to be on your deathbed or your medical bed in an emergency. The ability that you cannot adopt and own a, a certain person, right? These are things that you know, every average person needs to feel comparatively not like a second class citizen and that's why you simply cannot force people to forego these things. But more importantly, even if it's not tangible considerations, it's just the way that you behave, right? Like how can you fully express yourself around your parents and actually be yourself around your friends Talk to them about your struggles and confine that at least one straight passing person, right? That you were actually, um, yeah, that you, you are actually should be legitimized and uh, get support from them. Before I move on to the second thing, closing. All of this analysis is just how the community tries to educate. It then becomes a 50-50 whether people think of it as encouragement or a burden. It still comes up, comes down to whether or not people want to come up or not. It's not a pressure at all. It's just what could be. You can make the decision if it's beneficial or not. On the actor level, we think that you really cannot be yourself and that's why we'll bite the burden as to if there's a pressure involved. Secondly, in terms of unity, and this is where I out-impact the opening debate, even if you don't believe anything I've said so far. Realize that a lot of stuff in the LGBT movement is divisive right at the end of the day. Gay and lesbian groups often monopolize the discussion away from the trans community. They need to fight for different protections, trans people focusing more on things like bathrooms, while um, you know, more privileged LGBT people are moving on to civil unions. The reality is, at least this is a shared struggle that everyone can relate to it. Having to actually um, stop pretending to be cis and actually be yourself, that is something that can unify them in a lot of spaces. You can rally behind these things and create uh, consolidate even more critical mass. We tell you that this is the most important thing in the debate because only then do you actually enjoy a lot of the protections you give. The ultimate way that we will give you over opening government, their generic counterfactual is to say we want to pursue other non-controversial policies. But the simple question I have is, how will you enjoy these protections if you're not out? If you don't register who your partner is, if you don't register for that civil union to actually
actually be able to adopt a child. You have absolutely no benefits. Good luck, CG, trying to salvage that case, right? Lastly, then, on terms of outcomes, why is it necessary that we have critical mass to them as well? Firstly, in terms of weighing, right? I, okay. You need to be able to actually consolidate this critical voter base so that even if it's speculative that people will understand and sympathize with your plight, in the worst case, you will have a big enough group that you just need to be given into, right? Politicians who realize it's a significant voter base and the youth, they're liberalizing, becoming more LGBT. To cater to them, we need to give them some level of civil protection. That's regardless of their bigotry, it's just forcing them out at the end of the day. But lastly, in terms of the Overton window, you have to need more people to come out so that people can uh, like recognize the more median people to be able to access like extreme amounts of sexuality, you need people to at least be out and for people to understand that as a normal kind of thing. For all these reasons, too much material, we have to advance. <laughs> Struggles. People 
people often then get scared of the struggle first as opposed to talk about it. The second, third is standard. You see her stories about how difficult it is, how massive of a hurdle it is, and how strong these people are when they come out of it. These are standard that you need to be that strong as well. This person can do it, why can't you? The fourth is the focus on LGBTQ. To change the conservative, you need to be the agent of change. You need to change the people around you. When most likely you just want to live comfortably in your own skin, our counterfactual allows people to come out easier. When we don't put emphasis on it, when we say that it's okay to be private about it, to tell people around you because of two reasons. A, you don't make it an event that is scary and so important. It's just a phase in your life. And that's okay because you have other identity you can exercise and being gay can be important, but you know, doesn't always have to be the most important identity. The second is you can pick and choose who to tell. You don't have to tell your parents. You don't have to tell those that are conservative to make sure that you make a huge fast. Why is this contribution important? The first is that this can see a lot of the harm that always told you, right? On, uh, you know, the benefit of coming out, and then the harm of a lot of people not coming out, and etc. We can see to all that, and that's why we have more people coming out and mitigate that on our side, or flip that. And the second, we are able to access a lot of the benefit from OO, because a lot of OO's arguments are just, why is it good for people to come out? Without, and our side allows people to access that benefit, to access the benefit of self controlization of coming out, without dehumanizing them, without ensuring that they have to put or go through such a amount of side frame. The second argument we are talk about identity building. No, thank you. The thesis here is that women are multifaceted. We are people with culture, belief, and different types of principle, and that is not defined by a single form of identity. Out and prop movement necessitate that being gay is the sole identity that matters to you due to three structural reasons. The first is publication. Unlike other identities such as your political leaning, religion, jobs, and etc., LGBTQ and sexual orientation demands you to publicize it. Come out of it. Talk about it to, towards people that are the most important to you. Tell every single your friend about it. There is no out as a Christian or out as a liberal movement, but there is an out for gay movement and such. Right? Yeah. The second yeah. is the political leaning of LGBTQ. You can't be a conservative who is silent. And you can't be a conservative who is also LGBTQ, for example. You can be a conservative and also become out and proud because people will harm you. The third is religion religion, belief, the classes, etc. You can't be a Muslim or a Catholic that, you know, uh, be, is also out and proud because most likely people around you are going to attack you. They are abandoned by the community and the cost of them is costing their other self-identity such as their political belief, their religion. Because in order for them to come out, they have to abandon this political leaning that's concerned. They have to abandon their religion, the people around them and such. The fourth is that it's overbearing in optic and increased stereotyping even within the liberal communities. Right. People forget to see you who you are. You are loud in the public gay person in the room or the slave queen when you perhaps doesn't fall into that category but there are a lot of stereotypes on their side of you know explaining why we need to be loved we need to ensure that we talk about it and we need to ensure that we come out uh, one thing gayness is not your whole identity but to enjoy lots of basic human rights and joys like law or behavior you need to declare your lifestyle who your partner is talking to your friends about your love life are you okay with living a double life i enjoy eating bobby cooling this uh, afternoon, right? But I don't have to post about it. I can still access a lot of the benefits they have without me making it so important and publicize it. Why the fuck does that matter? The fifth is the importance and how big of an event it is. The suddenly coming out equals to all of your sort of problems are solved and you have to interact with the world. People don't publicize about what happens when you come out, right? What's next? How do you deal with the cognitive dissonance of your either identity that exists within you and such? The impact is A. God disallow intersectionality. You have to be a liberal to join the movement. You can be yourself in your community like what the world tells you. Secondly, at best, God have massive buy-in. People have to sacrifice on their identity, who they are and such. And the third is massive stereotype. And people don't see you more than just your identity of being gay because that's what you constantly talk about in social media. You have to show it to other people and talk about it and people just see you as being gay, right? On our side, on our counterfactual, the thesis here is we allow people to live with their identity. Of being gay and other identity that they will have still can exist. This is likely because A, you minimize the coming up moment. You see it as just a phase and a part of your life that might be big, but you know, it's just a phase and etc. right? The second is you feel more safe and less cognitive difficult on our side because we allow intersectionality when people can live with their own identity and doesn't have to sacrifice their religion, their belief, and such. I believe that gay people should also access the ability to exercise the religion that they care about, to access the political leaning that is equally as important to them. You do not disallow them from accessing that. Pronto. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
reform. The scary, scary thing about government is they assume absent this media, the default will be accepting when it never has and never will be. It will and will continue to be. Misrepresentative, caricaturized media. That's why the prominence of the LGBTQ within this space is important to correct it. Three extensions from closing opposition. First of all, talking about the true counterfactual, why Gov can't claim any of their benefits. Secondly, talking a little bit about shame and winning the characterization debate. And thirdly, talking about benefits to those that haven't come out, winning the precise stakeholder that opening opposition refuses to engage with. Let's first move into some direct refutation to closing government's extension, which really just relies on a vague interpretation of the status quo. They just say it's still glorified to some degree, so you still come out privately with not, never specifying the degree to which this is glorified. So my whole extension will be why the version of this glorification without LGBTQ presence will become worse and worse, and why the nature of the push is too much. But, before, but aside from that, right, I also want to do two other responses to this. So the first thing is, we just want to point out there's zero tipping analysis in this material, right? Like, if you already have these people that are willing to talk to you, willing to be sensible about it, then these are the same people that will talk to you about how it's a bad idea to post it in social media. So if you have already individuals that you can trust and talk to about privately, then it just doesn't make sense. But secondly, this also doesn't make sense in the way up, right? It's you're already a person that has a strong support network that you can trust and confide in. When the whole point is that the absence of the movement and the absence of the presence of a body you can talk to without feeling scared that you might be outed, someone that you can ask about what it's like to be outed, or someone that you can ask about what it's like to tell your parents about it, these are the people that we need the most because these are the people who are there for when you have no one else. That is when you don't have a private confidant, when you don't have a partner that supports you. That's why we need the movement because they are there when no one else is. So immediately we're outweighing them because one, we show that the comparative would be maybe you have some private partners, but you lose an important private space for the vast majority of people who don't have this alternative. So immediately, if you believe closing government's extension, then you must believe closing opposition is taking first. Having said that, we move to the first extension. We want to talk about the true counterfactual because I think opening opposition is right at saying there might be a chance that you will still have default talking about partner gays in a characterized manner. The problem is that they really don't build this. The vertical extension from closing opposition is simply that this is likely to be incredibly bad, default to terrible standards, and change the push in a way that makes you come out but always feel ashamed of it. Three reasons why. The first is that even if the LGBTQ stop their prominence within this presence, there's still a market that's expanding and straight, you know, hope, you know, hope, you know this homophobic people still, these you know, media sites still want to capitalize on this increasing trend and so have an incentive to make money of it. So the people in charge of it change, but the media will still exist and the way it's done changes. Secondly, is that sensationalizing an existing media without the moderating force of the LGBTQ would create incentives to make it more and more sensationalized, become more and more attractive and more and more eye catching, which means there's a strong incentive to make it le as less representative as possible. But thirdly, and finally, is that the majority of pre existing depictions, even if there's no current media influence, the problem is that past media that people refer to, people look to, don't mind the white chap. Just shows that it gets so, so much worse because of the fact that pre-existing media will also tell you terrible things about what it's like to come out, either saying it's so easy or saying that you shouldn't come out at all because it doesn't matter to you, despite the fact that this is the past and standards have changed and become more progressive into the future. So those three reasons show that the default will still be bad if they oppose it, meaning that if this dissolves, right, you get all the harms on government. What is the net change having established it in the absence of the LGBTQ prominence? The first that you lose the ability to control nuance. You lose the ability to say it's important them, not just because it's always important, but because it's important because it's such a struggle to live under the shadow of the closet. It's such a struggle to live without being able to be public with your partner, for example. So the nuance available when you have an LGBT person in the writer's room, when you have advocacy pushing for the equality and diversity standards, is precisely when you get the change that makes the media more exclusive and how you get opening opposition's characterization in the first place. But secondly, the importance of the market influence, the fact that they're prominent within these spaces. They're the paying customers. They're the ones watching, which means there are stronger and stronger incentives to introduce this media is more and more representative. How do you situate this case within the debate? The first is, if you think opening opposition's characterization is debate winning, and it probably is because they come like 10,000 benefits, the problem is that it's hard to believe their characterization, you can only believe it in a world where the true counterfactual will get substantially worse. The second way you should situate this extension is that even if you leave none of the op benefits, the problem is that it's still preferable because GOV is a world that gets worse on comparison. So on net, you should still prefer a slightly bad world if it avoids the worst outcomes that government bench wants to avoid so thoroughly. This concludes the extension and shows we win the debate in the first way. Let's secondly win the characterization debate more thoroughly. Let's talk about the movement itself. 
I think opening opposition stops and saying they don't want to hurt members of the movement, but I think Gov is right in criticizing this as kind of a flimsy point of why the characterization is true. But I think the issue here is right, they might believe it's the best way to do force them to shame them and all these kinds of things. So there are three reasons why the way that they will do this will not be through shame, but rather be to make it more accessible, make it easier to do it, fight for specific legislation. So there are three reasons why. The first is that quite thoroughly, right, it just makes sense, right? This is run by people who went through that same struggle, who went through that same pressure. So if it's so bad, and they're the ones that are in charge of it, there's no reason why they would force it onto others. Secondly, more importantly, no one would listen or support you if you're really just shaming people and telling lies about the authentic experience, which is why there's an attempt to make it as authentic as possible. But thirdly is that you have to explain why it's important. You're not just saying it's important for no reason, like closing government is suggesting. You're saying it's important because the absence of it made me feel a deep hole in my life. It was important because I came to a new set of friends around me. It was important because maybe I did like other things, but the ability to achieve and be, be happy in these things was gated by the fact that I couldn't live my freest life. So there are many reasons why it's important, but they explain why it's important. These three things prove the characterization necessary to us understand that it's not shame that's forcing people to do this, but rather the emphasis and the importance. How do you evaluate this material at the round, before that opening, up, opening government? LGBT representation in the media has been hard fought by LGBT creators, audiences, and actors. There are incentives in the same amount of people who are going to want to tell good LGBT stories just without a focus on coming out on our side. Why is there any change? But without opening government's funding, so they can't get paid, so they can't get salaries, without opening government's market. So even if they exist, nobody's listening to them. Maybe opening government is right. There's some existence, but they get suppressed without the prominence. Okay, let's now move on to the final point here, which is why it's better for people that haven't come out yet. The first is that the existing legislation that we would fight for specific to our side, not just general legislation, but things like making it hard to discriminate against someone who hasn't come out yet, or making it impossible to discriminate against someone through legislation, for example. One is that it just feels safer in general. So if it's safe to come out, you don't feel afraid about being out there. So even if you don't come out, you can feel safe about expressing parts of your identity because you don't feel afraid that someone's constantly going to ask who you are because that kind of thing becomes illegal or harder to do. But beyond that, second, you get the value of the veil of anonymity. You don't have to be afraid because other people are coming out publicly too, which means if there's some discrimination, it gets directed to them, not you, which means you're much, much safer off. But thirdly, and more importantly, is that you get more information through this process. You're validated through this experience. Regardless of if you want to come out or not, the question that will make you feel unhappy, make you feel unsafe at home, is the question of am I valid as a human being? Knowing that other people went through these experiences through, knowing that there's a community, a movement dedicated to celebrating the fact that it was important for you to have the struggle in the first place, is precisely the reason why closing opposition opposes. and not the Delta YouTube prioritizing today. First, opposition talks about traction. First reason this is inexclusive, because we still have, talk, we still talk about being out and proud on our side. It's just not a prominent part of the movement. So it's something that still, we still learn. You can look at my members speak for material on that. Second of all, we say if you overly prioritize it over a long amount of time, it's still gonna give dimension in returns. So you can't make it prominent consistently because it's not gonna be as empowering as, as, or as novel over time. So this is something that you cannot constantly prioritize over time. Second of all, they say that it validates people to come out, that be afraid, feel safe, and all that. What are our responses? First, we still allow that on go. We still discuss and educate how to navigate it. It is definitely still going to be part of it because we say it's a valid part of the LGBTQ movement. But the other part of being valid, which my member talked about, which had minimal response, is something that needs to be prior, uh, that needs to be not overshadowed as well. On a personal level, we still we say you still come out, come out to close friends and family, comfort with people who care about. CEO talks about how well. This is the debate is then for people when you don't have someone else. One, you still have that on our side. There's no way that we have to defend an LGBTQ community that shames you for coming out. They're still always going to be there. But second of all, this is for the people who still do not have anyone regardless, they will also still have to conceptualize that they have to do it, which means on their side of the house, they have to admit it's some sort of pressure. 
And on top of that, as far as the media and like um, normalization that opening talks about, the celebrities and public figures come out anyway and they get a lot of media coverage anyway. Because one, they have the protection to do it, so they don't feel like they need the movement to protect them to begin with. Second of all, it's something that makes them feel liberated, as OO says, which means they'll do it anyway and they'll get publication and information regarding out and proud anyway. The movement doesn't have to step in and be the one that talks about it. On opposition, instead what we feel is it's going to be invalidating because now there's a burden to make it a big deal. But the way for this is one, prominence isn't as beneficial as all makes it out to be. It's marginal because people coming out still happens. Opposition has to push people to come out even when they're not ready. Pressure is not, when they talk about pressure is not there. If not, then you don't get the benefit of people being liberated by being out. So they have to admit this harm. Second of all, if it's about, we say it's more important about being, accepting yourself as being gay, which isn't exclusive to being out and proud. We say being in, existing and the intersectionality we talk about as well. Third of all, this then should not be the biggest impact. Being existence is enough to help, and so this is marginal. But the second part is our main extension. Why the out and proud movement as a concept on its own is already invalidating your other identities, especially if you make it prominent. Ojiwe talks about how the movement portrays itself, but it's missing the other side of the analysis. The internal way individuals directly feel and think about themselves when they interact with this movement. Because they talk about how other people tell you stuff, but unless you explain how you feel when you are told these things, this argument does not fly. Because Ojiwe uh, simplifies it to burden and pressure. And Oa says it's a pathway, but we talk about why this is a bad thing. They're only mentioned, they mention education, and Seal talks about they will give more nuance to the education. But what's the actual content of the education? That's something that my member talks about. It's not just normalization and knowing how to do it, but the how to do it, we say is harmful. What is that content? Internally, on an individual level, you are most likely, someone who is the most vulnerable in this debate, are people who still think about their religion, who are not sure about prioritizing being LGBTQ as their main identity. People who have conflict with the other parts of that identity. For example, if they care about their culture, but it's conservative because there's a lack of representation of the LGBTQ right. people in their own culture. These other identities were there for you from the very beginning of your life. You sacrificed time and effort on your job. You already went through so much to feel comfortable with those other identities as well. This makes it valid. On opposition, you make it feel important to the point where it's overwhelming all of those other identities and making this intersectional group very, very invalidating. And this is also manifesting in a way that it is primed and told to you over a long amount of time. From the, from the days that you were a teenager, all your friends ask about when are you going to come out? How are you going to come out? It makes it an important point of your life, making it so over, that to the point where you want to overshadow everything else you've done before you come out. This then messes with your conception of you. This takes out a lot of your identity to the point where being out is the most important part of your life. OG harm kicks in only when you want people to come out yeah. and the risk of other people's views and the external interactions. CJ is the one that tells you what you actually kick out. Why it's not just burden or pressure, but you're actively dehumanized to the point where you're only characterized as someone who is LGBTQ and someone is part of the community and someone who has to interact in a specific way rather than validating all of those other identities. CJ is the one that fulfills the gap on how you can consolidate this feeling internally and what the interactions are. CEO says then, well, it's still important to conceptualize it. Well, one, on their side, you overly do it to the point you're deprioritizing the other part, the other parts of your identity, something not justified on their side. Oh, says it's dehumanizing to not be out, but it's also dehumanizing where you have to prioritize being LGBTQ over everything else in your life because what you're told when you're told, because they themselves admit it is okay to sacrifice all of these other things, but that in and of itself is already dehumanizing and something they didn't explain. Oh, then talks about, well, they'll teach people how to react to it. Yet again, this is just the external way people tell you things, but not how you feel internally. How people of the target of the advocacy feels about themselves is logically prior to this because it hurts you before you even come out or don't come out. And thirdly, when you say you cannot access the benefits of progress or policy if you're not what? If you're not out. One, guess what? You don't care about the benefits or not even if you access them because in order to access them, you have to sacrifice all of your other identities first. So even if you can have gay marriage on your side, you felt invalidated with all of your career beforehand because you were told it is okay to sacrifice them. It is okay to sacrifice those parts those part of your part culture as well. You then make the trade-off be enforced on opposition so the idea of benefit is something that is a zero sum. Right. Before I move on to the uh, rest, I'll take a moment. So there will be some big shadow, but your shadow is one where you're double life. You don't have media figures to look up to because in your world, these people may also prioritize their identity as their public figure and therefore not come out, therefore decreasing.
in your ability to feel okay in private. All of our analysis on an individual level, people want to come out, still applies. Yeah, Second yeah, of all, yeah. if you're a public figure, we already mentioned, you feel protected anyway, so you come out. So as far as knowing and being okay with being out and proud, it still exists on our side. We don't have to defend a world where being out and proud is shame, but it's something that simply exists as an option. So on the impacting of this, one, the movement and the advocacy on their side overwhelms your sense of self. This is a huge harm that affects the most vulnerable member of the LGBTQ community. The ones with the intersection of religion, conservative cultures, where they are success still susceptible to all those feelings and they still deem those important. Second of all, CG doesn't just talk about the pressure of doing the coming out, but the conception of coming out that is told to you is to deprioritize the other parts of your identity. This deprioritization of your connection with your family, of your connection with your religion, of your connection with your culture, if it's conservative. This means that the way for this is one, this is the argument that fulfills the process that the opening debate talked about. How do people internalize the education and the information that is spread out? And second of all, the intersectionality that we talked about is the most vulnerable group because they're the ones harmed the most. So when the action of unproud happens in a good way on their side, all of our harm still apply because in that process, you felt dehumanized to the point where this motion stands. Yeah. It's inescapable. They already dangerously romanticize it even before they have any conversations about the people of the movement for the same natural incentives that CG explains. Because people want to feel safe in their own skin. Because people want to have a loving relationship with their parents. What we demonstrate then in extension was crucial and it received no response from them, which is that people will still have conversations about coming out. People will still portray it in media. People will still glorify it and romanticize it. But in God's world, it is the wrong people. It is straight writers who have incentives to sanitize it, to romanticize it, to say it's not that bad, it's not that hard. You can always live a normal life because of it. That LGBT people have enough. They already have a safe environment, and thus there is no need to care about it. That is the counterfactual that is most destructive and why we win this round. Let's do three things in this speech. Let's first eliminate CG and their push on intersectionality. We agree that this debate isn't just about the generic benefits about whether people want to come out or not come out. But unfortunately, the entirety of the CG case is premised on the same faulty assertion as OG, which is that the movement will do this in a specific way, which is to emphasize that your identity as a gay individual should supersede all other identities. They give you three reasons for this. I want to explain why none of them stand. The first thing they say is that the public nature of it makes it the emphasis. Again, publicity does not equate to it being your sole identity. Just because you wear a hijab doesn't mean you can also be an investment banker or a lawyer. Just because you look brown and are clearly Pinoy or you're clearly Chinese doesn't mean that people automatically assume that it's the very core of your identity. The second thing they say is that you are liberal. I would point out that many people are already liberal within the movement, so it's unclear what delta this has in the debate. The final thing they say is that the movement convinces you that this is your most important identity. But we explain that that isn't inherently a bad thing, particularly through the mechanisms that David provides. That the way the movement does this is to talk about the actual things that change in your life once you come out. Not just to generically say that everything gets better magically, but to admit that there are certain concessions you make and that those trade-offs are yours to make. So you might have to have a strained relationship with your dad, but it means being able to freely live with your partner. It's not this generic blank slate that manifests in the counterfactual on their world where gay people are forced, falsely misled to believe that they can keep it all and that the experience is entirely non-damaging. But even then, they never prove that in the counterfactual, you can practice intersectionality. The fear of being discovered at every moment precludes intersectionality. You can't go to church without fearing being outed, without feeling deep internal dread, because your pastor says you're a sinner, you're dirty, and you know that you feel dirty feelings for that boy who's cute in the other aisle. You can't go to a job or you prevent yourself from applying to certain jobs because you fear being discriminated in the hiring process. You can't joke around with your toxic uncles because you feel assaulted by every job they make and you know you can't 
tell them off because you're afraid that they will call you gay, that they will make fun of you, that they will ostracize you from that community. It takes people to protect you once you've come out for you to feel comfortable in your own skin, even if it's not your choice to come out eventually. And that's why people are more able to practice intersectionality in our world and CG is out. Let's secondly take out OG and their frankly unrealistic portrayal of the movement. There are two reasons they fall out of this debate. The first is that their case is premised on the assertion that the movement will do this in a way that romanticizes the experience of coming out. And the only real reason they give for this is to say that you need to convince people that life gets better in order for them to come out. A, this doesn't require you to romanticize the moment of coming out. You can say that it was bad for me, my dad rejected me, but eventually life got better through other aspects of it. But B, this doesn't, uh, this other also now natural incentives and pressures that already exist as per their own analysis and reinforced by OCG. The movement isn't the one writing BL, it isn't the one writing Love, Simon. These authors have independent incentives and will continue to portray gay people. What you lose is the prominence and the ability of the movement to criticize that. This, by the way, is the response that GovWeb uses to say we can still have discussions about coming out that simply falls out because you have less ability to do that, you have less resources to do that, and less weight in these conversations. But we provide two more mechanisms in David's extension, which explains why these portrayals actually become better in our world. First, the fact that only the movement has an, an incentive to be accurate, to sustain support, and actually reflect the lived experience of gay people, rather than continuously pander to the tastes of straight audiences. But second, the flip, that absent the out and proud movement being prominent, it's that these people are able to write these things unfetteredly, and you never have enough incentive to call them out. They want to portray it as bland, they want to portray it as generic and fairy tale esque so that they themselves can evade criticisms of not knowing what the gay experience is like. So this is why their internal validation push that you can just live and be yourself in DPM never really manifests because you're still exposed to narratives of toxic positivity. You're still exposed to narratives that say life would be so much easier if you just came out, but you know in your real life that you cannot access those things. So the blame shifts. You no longer see it as your society and community being wrong. You see it as you yourself being wrong because you access less narratives to begin with. I'll take you. This debate is set in the status quo in present. If LGBT authors like the bisexual author of Love, Simon stop emphasizing coming out, do you think people are just going to accept straight people taking over and not question it at all? I would point out in many parts of the world, there are still very toxic narratives about coming out. If you've ever read The Boy's Love, many of these things are oversimplifying, saying that it's as easy as going to a bar and finding love there. I think many people don't have access to many of these wonderful narratives, which is what we provide them and what we don't. But the second reason why OG is out, even if you believe their positive material stance, is that there's absolutely no engagement from them as to the people who come out in either world. And it's rather disgusting for them to assert that these people all lived in privileged societies where they're protected anyways. Many don't. Many live in the developing world. Many want to settle down with their partner. Many want to live in. And many still face intense harassment even in the rich countries they talk about. And it's for these people that they have absolutely no mechanisms of protection. Why then should you weigh these people over the people who stayed in the closet in OG? Two reasons we provide. First, because they face the most intense stigma the most upfront harassment. When you are in the closet, you always have plausible deniability. You can always hide behind the face of being a straight man. The people who are already out and already have that information out there need legislation to protect them because they can't rely on hiding. But second, and most importantly, these are the people who lend capacity to the movement. They're the ones who attend pride parades. They're the ones who go out and vote for legislation. So if you believe that any change manifests in this debate, you have to believe our case because we're the ones who give the movement capital to do so. Finally, why do we way over opening. One, Riff's trick is untucked, so that's a practice grip points. <laughs> Secondly, we engage with the after they don't and explain why things get better also for the people who choose not to come out. But thirdly, we simply outweigh them. That's to say, even if you believe there are harms on opposition, we explain why things are worse on government, and that takes it above them.